Welcome to the Praxology Podcast, where theology fuels the mission of the church. In the Praxology community, we believe that mission is furthered through deep reflections on God, His actions in the world, and, of course, how we participate. We believe we can participate well through thinking biblically, reflecting theologically, and acting missionally. On today's episode, we sort of make up a term to talk about the theme of emotions, uh, basically how incorporating them into ministry practice can lead to discussions of things like mental health and, and, and so on. And besides that can lead to holistic formation. I'm Sean Smith with Tyler Patty. And Tyler, why don't you just go ahead and lead us straight into the episode today? All right, let's go for it. I'm excited. So if you listen to our previous two episodes, um, focusing on the, the theme of anxiousness, um, we're going to try and go a little step deeper today um, and talk about the emotive state, emotion and the role it, it plays in spirituality and in mission and, uh, and, and how they should be handled or not in the context of discipleship. So our title, Emotional Discipleship, for this episode is partly borrowed from Pete Scazzaro's newer book entitled Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. So, and the, the, the assumption word. there is that, yeah, that there's also emotionally unhealthy discipleship. Um, so if, if you're interested in going deeper, it's a great resource to check out um, on, on this topic. We're going to restrict ourselves a little bit more narrowly in this episode um, to discuss what are emotions, what to do with them. And how does that connect with our broader theme this season of serving missionally, your knowledge toolkit for success? Yeah, essentially, anxiousness is just one of those. Uh, there are multiple. And so we're taking a step behind the curtain, as it were, uh, to look at what uh, we, the people that we have in front of us in ministry have these emotions that are oftentimes under the surface and being lived out. And, and sometimes we're aware, sometimes we're not. So how do we locate emotion in the human body, I think is important to know so that we can work with it um, more effectively. Um, but before we do that, let's simply just discuss in three areas how emotion is talked about or how it's used. So first, biblical studies, second, theology, and third, in ministry itself with uh, more like, what do we mean, like practical ministry here? So uh, biblical studies... It's the I, best I place pretend. to start. Right? I have a caricature, but I won't even go there. So, Let's, Tyler, I, I mean, we only really need to talk about biblical studies, right? That's that's all. That's all that we need to do. So, no, it is the right place to start. So, thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me go first. I mean, it, it does also set the parameters, I suppose, for talking about emotion it through does. characters in the Bible itself. That is that is a good starting point. It is. Well, so I mean, we could have multiple multiple episodes on how the Bible talks about emotions and incorporates it into its theology. Um, if you're interested in going deeper into that, I have two book recommendations. Um, they're both, they're written by two, um, two biblical scholars. Uh, the first one is by Gerald Peterman called Joy and Tears. Maybe a hundred, hundred or so pages. Looks not, like. not too long. Really easy to read. The subtitle is The Emotional Life of the Christian. And he looks at, he kind of talks about his journey from, from growing up kind of a stoic Christian, like uh, somebody who tries to suppress his emotions. That's to, a- to reading the Bible and realizing, oh, wow, there's actually a lot in here that, that talks about the right ways to express and feel your emotions. And then the second one, um, this is uh, these are both professors of mine in my undergraduate program. second one is called Between Pain and Grace, A Biblical Theology of Suffering by Gerald Peterman and Andrew Schmutzer, who is my mentor. And uh, it it's focuses more narrowly on the, the topic of like, negative emotions, I would say, and mm. uh, in the context of suffering and what to do and what to do with that, how to think about it theologically. So these are great resources to go a little deeper. But um, I think the best place to start when thinking about what th- how the Bible thinks about emotions is either we could start talking about um, the what it means to be made in the image of God. That's probably a much longer discussion about, you know, is being made in God's image uh, a lot of people have thought for a long time it's just the ba- ability to. You're think. delving into theology now. You I am better step back. I, am, I am, but a lot of I'll this take is it further in a minute. Connected to like, in, how do we interpret what the text says? So is is being made in the image of God just something like, oh, I can think. I'm not an animal, so I can think, and that makes me like God. Or uh, is there some space for some kind of uh, emotional? Uh, state that that connects us in a way to God. Um, certainly, the relational aspect of it, it being image bearers is really important for that text. But but to the point of you know, is emotion something that we might 
share with God or that he might actually be uh, sharing with us. Um, it's really interesting, uh, and this is an area that you and I slightly disagree about, which is fun. But I would I would say the Bible talks about God having emotions, and actually they're foundational to the way that they talk about God and how He relates. So a great place to go. You want to jump in? I uh, uh, can't uh, via appropriations. We'll see about that relating to. But if you step back and think what God outside of time. That that does a whole lot to what what can and cannot yeah, be said. We're starting. God. We're just we're starting with the Bible. We're in time right now. We'll so, move back. We'll move okay. back behind the curtain theology in a moment. So when we think about okay, I mean we're gonna get to the theology part, but often we think about God in terms of the things that He's able to do, like His His He's om, omniscient. He knows everything. He's omni uh, om present. Om, omnipresent. He's able to be everywhere. Uh, he's omnipotent. He can do whatever He wants. Um, but the Bible often talks about God in these kind of relational, emotional categories. So when God actually defines himself to Moses um, in Exodus 34, he says, uh, the Lord or Yahweh, God's personal name, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion and sin. There's, there are some elements there of the things that he does, like, um, exp, you know, expressing uh, uh, love to others and, and being truthful, forgiving iniquity, but also talks about him as being compassionate. That's kind of an emotional state, at least the way we, uh, we understand it. Gracious, that's also an emotional, relational kind of category. Uh, faithful love. Um, there, that that also is 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 a complicated emotion that's tied to a lot of other things. Um, even uh, slow to anger. That's certainly an emotion, or uh, you know, it's at least we understand it that way. So he's slow to anger. It means he does get angry, except but he but he doesn't get angry um, unnecessarily quickly. So this, I would say, this kind of starts us off by at least thinking about, hey, emotions might not be all that bad. Um, they might be an important category through which to read our Bibles um, as we seek to understand how God relates to us, but also how we relate to him. That's my two cents. More to be said, and you might disagree, and that's totally fine. <laughs> that's a good segue into theology, and oftentimes why at the, the academic level, theologians will, will spar or another word for spar, like lightly wrestle with each other, you know, theologians and biblical scholars. We, we actually like each other and think both disciplines are useful, yes. but the, the starting points um, kind of butt heads. And this one of the areas is it, in considering the biblical data, of course, we say God has feelings. And biblical scholars, you don't have to take the next step and go, is that actually possible for a divine being to be that way. And historically speaking, the answer has been God is simple. And so while it may appear that God has this character, these emotions, that there's, there is a divide. People say, yes, God can have emotions or ultimately God does not, is not able being spirit, being divine to possess such human type of traits. Um, though then what do you do with we're made in the image of God as we're coming back to. Um, and, and I would even go a step further in, in Galatians, the fruit of the spirit. Yes. That, that fruit is the spirits produced in us. And so if that becomes a composite picture of who God is as a whole, then we have something that we can say at least for taking conversation forward of God's character. Um, then, but again, we're, we're now getting into issues and I'm just going to sidestep and move on to a different level of theology. Is God is God ultimately simple, um, and and can God change? Because if you say can God change, of course God has emotions. Bam, easy, well done. If if you say well, uh, what what exactly does change mean? And if you say no, then it presents a lot of difficulties that you have to figure out more philosophical theologically, in order to say anything about God and emotions. So I'm coming across as a skeptic, <laughs> ultimately. Um, but, but, but I think landing in fruit of the character spirit is a good mm -hmm. is a good place. I mean, that's actually something that Peterman talks about in his Joy and Tears. That you know, what does it mean that joy, for example, is a fruit of the spirit? That also is 
an emotion that is somehow uh, somehow uh, allows us to more deeply reflect who God is. So we do have to wrestle with both sides, and I think I like that. You know, when we have these discussions, we can come from our respective sides and and uh, and, and and talk about it, uh, and also appreciate that. Okay, there are different constraints from our different disciplines and how we talk about these things. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, so how? Yeah, let me let me go a further. step further then, and more more generally, and in, in terms of starting points, that that we just got into the weeds. <laughs> we did. <laughs> um, in theology, the, impos- uh, the 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 driving force for emotional talk typically, I think, derives from issues such as how, how we're created in God's image um, and, and whether or not it's possible for God, who's, again, spirit, to have such th- such things. Um, and and it, it ties into the issues of the omniscience, immutability, and, and so on. It's, it's not calling those things into question, of course. It's just saying, well, do we have the right philosophical justification for our belief? Is, is our belief founded on something good or, or not? Um, I think, though, an easier access is, is through philosophical theologies, basically unraveling this idea of the, the uh, Cartesian cogitative thinking. Ooh, that's a fun In other mouthful. words, <laughs> at, at least from Descartes, Cartesian, Descartes, uh, famous philosopher, uh, he's used as a punching bag. For like everybody today, <laughs> basically everybody, especially in theology and, and philosophy. Um, he had this idea that, that you can sort of separate the divine, uh, not the divine being, you can separate humanity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so thinking mm-hmm. and the body mm-hmm. are at war with each other. And you can see this just played out and I'm, I'm moving too quickly. The The, the mind gets the... The, 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 all, I'm going to say the brain is a better term. Yeah, gets yeah. prioritized over the body, and this is where we get that idea of the. Um, you just mentioned at the beginning of the episode um, that thought that creeps into the separation that were that our our emotions are evil things that we have to get rid of. Um, stoicism. Oh, stoicism, yeah, yeah, yeah that which is an ancient philosophy that goes way, way back beyond Descartes as well. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. but but that 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 then it it yeah. creeps in. It does, and and so I think where emotions come in and in philosophical theology, systematics broadly, is what do we do with the human person? What is a human person? Because we have to answer that really first before we can say how do we relate to God. When we say how do we relate to God, we're making an assumption of what human makeup is. So the, the traditional problem in, in something that's called philosophy of mind, for those interested in looking further, is the connection between the brain and the body. You know, is there a triad or a dyad? Is there a mind, body, and spirit? Or are we, no, there is no such thing as spirit, we're just mind and body. And, oh, by the way, what exactly is mind? Nobody agrees on that until just fairly recently some social psychologists are in agreement on that definition of mind moving it forward. Um, but really the connection for emotions is the brain and the body. How does the brain connect with the body and how does the body influence or not our thinking? Mm -hmm. That's, that's really the starting point I think in, in systematics very generally. Nice. And I guess then, uh, for thinking about, um, so we don't need, I mean, we can, in a sense for now, set aside the question of God and we can think theologically about what do we do as people with the the yep. the gifts that we have been given? Because we have been given a mind. We've also been given our body. Um, and theologically, we have a spirit as well. And so is the body something to just kind of like uh, tolerate <laughs> with its emotions and be like, okay, keep it under control um, or... Or have or we're not, or or is it something that actually we need to really focus on? Um, like some um, some of the charismatic movements, they focus very heavily on emotions mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. a way of connecting with God and a way of emotionally growing. Like you grow through these crisis moments. Um, it's one of the reasons why uh, music is used so powerfully in charismatic movements and has actually been spread throughout a lot of different denominations because yeah. of this assumption. Actually, our bodies maybe overemphasis on our bodies are really, really good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, now we're into the practical, um, the, that third biblical, mm-hmm. the, the systematic philosoph- philosophical, biblical, or uh, the practical now. I contend that evangelicals, standard churches do the same thing. The, the, the 
deep song is the one that's sung right at the end Ooh. before oh, yeah. you pray and the pastor s- like sneaks up there, you know, and everybody else sneaks back and goes and sits down. And it's <laughs> the weird stuff that's happening there, it's just, whatever. But even that you can see is an intent to lead people into worship. However, what does that mean? Especially when we're talking music, we're talking things that that drive our habits and desires. We're talking emotion. And so we're back to that problem of how does emotion fit Mm -hmm. in philosophy of mind, all these things in ministry. We feel it every day. I I think where does emotion fit? Mm -hmm. You can say there's a connection between the mind, the, the brain and the body. That's obvious. We're, we're embodied. We're a human being. But that, that still doesn't answer the question of, okay, so how do they really connect? And emotion is at the heart of that. And so you can, you can drum it up and use it for a, either a negative or a positive purpose mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. in ministry. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I think, well, I mean, we could use a, a like a straw man, a, a, a fake argument of some very, very conservative types of churches that simply the answer is emotions are bad. Mm-hmm. We don't really know anything about them, but we're primarily thinking things. And so the answer is mind over brain over body. Put it, put it, you're, you're, you're at war. You got to whip it into shape because then we whip out that verse from Paul, wherever that verse is that our, our, our you know, our bodies are temples and we have to like beat them into submission as it were. And that has a tendency to give privilege to the rational, which is something that I think isn't, well, what do you think? Practical in ministry, is this is that a harmful thing or no? Well, okay, let's take it to the to the level of discipleship. You know, your assumptions about the relationship between the the brain and the body really drives your method of discipleship and disciple making. If you think that you're primarily a thinking thing, like you said, mm-hmm. which is really fun to say in English, it doesn't really translate into other languages. A thinking thing, um, then discipleship is all about the things that you know. So, okay, got to make sure that we're teaching the right things, that everybody knows the right things. And then once they know the right things, then that will result in the right behavior and the right emotions. Um, Versus the other extreme would be to say, um, well, um, really the way to grow is to experience God's presence and to maybe even to put into practice and like get active before you even know anything about God. Um, or you're still really early, but okay, let's get you actually doing things and feeling things and experiencing things. And, um, that also doesn't always end super well. (laughs) So, so it kind of leaves us in this place where we, we kind of need to find a bridge between the two in discipleship. Like they, they need to go together. The question is how. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the thinking about the role of emotions in the human person is very, very helpful for leaders to know in order to serve missionally well. Um, so I, I'm going to give some, a, a few different theories. I won't go too much in, in depth, though I, I m- most certainly could. And it would be really fun. Um, but I'm just going to give a couple, and then we'll move it forward more more practically, and, and you'll kick us off there after I'm, I'm done. But I think this is actually a good spot for our lightning round. Ooh, so okay. today's today's lightning round brought to you. I'm giving you a thumbs up, Spencer. If if you're if you're watching on YouTube, if not, uh, a, a verbal thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you for giving us a, a few questions, uh, you listeners. If you're if you're now jealous of Spencer, um, who, who's on our international team with Josiah Venture, I reached out to him very last minute, and he obliged me with some questions. I, but I had teammate. the idea. So if you have some questions you want to ask of us, Praxology at Formation dot org. Uh, dot UK and, and, and we'll answer them. Bring it on. So I've, I've sort of pre looked at these, but I didn't, I didn't give any thought. Uh, your, your go-to movie or snack. I'm sorry. I just butchered his question. (laughs) What is your go-to movie, snack or candy? Movie, snack, movie, snack. Yeah. You're watching Netflix or you're watching a movie. What, Uh, what, What do you eat? Favorite thing? Um, this is a very common problem or question that I pose to myself. Um, it is, it really is. You're having an existential crisis now. I mean, I am having an existential crisis. I'm going to say chocolate. Okay. For me, movie theater, you have to have the popcorn, I suppose. And it's always the cheapest thing. So go with that at home. 
I love some sour, like sour gummy worms. Mm. Th- those I've been on, I've probably had way too many of those recently. Uh, they're good. Second question. If you had to write a fictional book, mm. what would it be about? This is a I was one, once told, actually it was, it was, uh, at me and my wife's, um, like pre-wedding party. Somebody told me that they thought that I would write a spy novel one day. A spy novel. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'll get around to it one day. Could be. I don't know that I have an answer. A fictional book, what would it be about? Probably something related to a... a I don't even know. Fictional. Maybe something about running. I really enjoy running. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe something about that. Running and, and I'd probably throw in random spiritual thoughts slash philosophy running with the spirit oh hey <laughs> we've got a we've got a working title thank okay. you spencer that might come out uh in your bookstores near you spencer likes to run too Sometime. so i think he'd be first to buy your book well cool third question and final there are many metaphorical images stories and parables in scripture do you have one that you have that recent that you've recently been thinking about or that sticks out. So a favorite metaphorical image or story, a parable. It's so good. It's a great, great, great question. Got reaction. Well, I'm doing some writing now on the metaphors and images in Revelation. And I don't wouldn't say I have a uh, like, uh, like I don't have them all figured out, but just the, um, like, okay, what's one that I can think of? I mean, okay, here, uh, the, the, the image, the image picture of the new Jerusalem has for a long time been really meaningful to me of the marriage of heaven and earth. So there you go. Mm-hmm. That's something to hope for and look towards. Yeah. Related to my, uh, current research, I'm really focused on actually some something we've already mentioned that the fruit of the spirit and, and how that relates to being like a, a summary of God's being or God's character. Um, I, there's a bunch of assumptions made there, but I'm looking at, at possible connections there. Um, so the, the, the image of the fruit really is a fascinating one for me related to like, you know, connect it with Psalm one and, and back into the garden with, with trees and then to new Jerusalem where the, the, the water is flowing from the throne and, but there are trees that we eat from and so forth. And how does that relate to things? Uh, so fruit and trees. <laughs> nice. Um, I, I feel like that's a very good, give me some street credibility here in the Czech Republic because everybody's got their backyards full of fruit trees. And so I, I think that's a good one, but also the idea of the spirit resting. And I'm fascinated with places the spirit rests and how it might be the same or different. But I'll leave it at that. All right. Yeah. I have a, I have a summer project for you, Sean. Plant some fruit trees. You, you're moving into your house, which is right next to my land fairly exactly. soon. So, so okay. I give you the task. Just think ahead to where we might build that we don't have any idea yet and plant us some trees. Sounds good. Deal. That's a, a project with your three children <laughs> that you can do this summer. <laughs> Fantastic. We've, we've solved many problems today. Thank you, Spencer. And uh, maybe we'll invite you over to uh, partake of the, the fruit of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it'll be a fruit of the vine. It depends on what Tyler plants. <laughs> there you go. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> well, let's go back into then um, a, a pretty big high level summary here of the emotion. We'll reflect theologically and, and perhaps bring in some, some think biblically. Um, I, I, we should, <laughs> um, to help locate emotions in human behavior, actions, and intentions. We often don't think about that though, right? Like we have, we just do stuff. Like we think, ah, Thursday, go to fridge, whatever. But there are, <laughs> <laughs> there are intentions behind that that we just oftentimes don't think about consciously, as it were. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of things going on underneath the surface of even a simple action of getting off the couch and going to get something. And then you, I, I won't, I, I said I wasn't going to complicate. Um, and these things help us to, to look at basically major views to help guide our thinking. So these primarily come from psychology and again, philosophy of mind. Um, which is a, a fascinating um, 
philosophical discipline that many people have engaged with, theologians and, and, and otherwise. Um, it, well, again, we'll see the issue of the brain-body connection and, and how humans are embodied. Uh, but that's a common systematic theological word today. It's cool. It's, it's the one that you should use. What does it mean? That's the question. Emotion theories. There's, there's one. I'm going to mention two here with some subsets. The big one. William James and I forget Lang, his, his first name, um, but it's called James Lang Theory. It's from the late 1800s, like 1880-something, I think. Um, William James is famous for another book he wrote called Varieties of Religious Experience, where this stuff comes out, I think, a bit. I, I've read the text. It's not prominent, but it comes out. <laughs> um, but he's written a lot of stuff related to religious experience and so on. Um, and he combined, and, and I think it was a separate theory than Lang, but they published within like a year of each other um, and basically said the same thing. So it's lumped in James Lang theory. And James gets more credit always for some reason. I don't know why. Let's make a petition to give Lang some more credit. I don't know. Emotion is the result of what they call arousal. So uh, emotion results basically from a perception of personal bodily states. Emotion comes from the body, not the mind, mm -hmm. basically. Um, so example, a dog barks and runs into the road while you're driving. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and as you're doing that, you're swerving. Mm -hmm. Did you think about that first? Definitely not. No, it's just this reaction that your bodily process has hijacked you and just took over and saved your life or the dog's life. And so they use that idea f forward to say basically um, that e emotion is simply the result of a bodily process. The tendency there is to tie emotion too closely to that bodily process, which can be defeated very quickly, but we don't have time for. Um, but this gave rise to so-called non-cognitive views of emotion, which, which you can imagine if it comes from the body, not from the, the brain, then we get these non-cognitive views. Um, so in the, in the James Lang theory, emotion is primitive. It's quite simple. Uh, it's not deriving from, from any sort of cognitive construal or thought process really at all. Um, but like, I, I don't know, 50 to 80 years later, uh, Schachter and Singer developed what they call the two factor theory, where basically there's, there's some kind of arousal, just like, you know, dog barks, Oh crap. And then, Pro your bodily processes take over. They don't. They don't deny that, but they, they add this idea that there is a a cognitive label that you put into your mind. And so for them, the result is it starts primarily from the body, but your mind has to make sense of it. So it gives it gives it a label, hmm. fear, for example, and then it's it's the bodily process that starts it, plus the cognitive label equals the emotion. And so there, I mean, obviously it's not as primitive as the James Lang theory and it's giving some sort of access to the mind. The mind is somehow involved. Um, so it's adding more than just the physiological bodily changes into the mix where emotion uh, is tied. Um, for example, a bodily, they, like they give examples like this, a bodily process can occur to help with digestion um, but that bodily process is not an emotion. <laughs> and so James Lang, like what's going on? Your theory is incomplete here. Uh, it might be right in some cases, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they obviously then go to, well, how does the mind get involved? Um, but even for them, I think a bodily feeling is not an emotion. Um, even though we often confuse those terms, a feeling with an emotion. A feeling usually is, is strictly related to uh, senses, perception, bodily things. Like I feel the microphone in front of me right now. That's uh, how does the microphone make you feel, Sean? <laughs> Excited because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be talking about these things today. Um, it, it, if we take this as a step further, we go, yeah, that makes sense. But but let's try, if we confuse it, it, it again, it's not too difficult to do. We can, we can uh, prove it not right in every case. But what does it say about a, a cognitive view of emotions? Those are non-cognitive starting points. The emotion comes from the body first. Sometimes the mind is involved or some other people would say no, never. Cognitive views obviously would start from the opposite viewpoints, <laughs> that emotions are tied to judgments. Um, so emotions are judgments of the mind. 
hence cognitive view, um, the script is, is basically just flipped entirely in the brain's favor. Um, but if you do this completely, you lose being able to say things like something makes you emotional, which happens. You listen to music or you go to the, I've heard many people say the Sistine Chapel, which I'm going to this summer. It's going to be fantastic. But many people say you go to the Sistine Chapel and they, they cry. Like, what's going on there? That's clearly like you're intaking things through your eyes and it appears to be more of a bodily process. You're not thinking, you, maybe you're thinking this is beautiful, but you're crying. And so it's not purely cognitive. Um, so if, if, if this is all true, then, then judgments are not always tied to emotion in the body. So cognitive views add the importance, I think, of the brain and decision-making and executive functioning. And so sometimes cognition is able to override the body, but not always. And so now we're stuck. Where does that leave <laughs> us with non-cognitive views don't, don't ultimately satisfy and cognitive views don't ultimately satisfy. Where does that leave us? Well, I, I think if we take a big step back actually, and we see one problem, the solution to that becomes how we move forward. Mm. And I, I would simply give some examples of, uh, Anthony DiMazio, Descartes error, um, and there are, there are several others. Matthew Lapine, The Logic of the Body. He's a theologian. Faithful Feelings from Matthew Elliott. He's also more in that in the, in the biblical theological realm uh, as places to go, as well as um, coming from MIT and, and Cambridge, United States, uh, Louis Pessoa, The Entangled Brain. He shows how all of that kind of works together and, and basically says we're a massive conglomeration of a complex system and it's hard to pick one from the other. And in fact, they both mutually inform. So that's the way forward. Um, but the one problem I think is that non-cognitive and cognitive views of emotion utilize a distinction between mind and body. Hmm. The issue is that we do not experience our humanity in such disjointed fashion. That's Stoicism true. and stuff, you know. Where's your brain, Sean? Where's your brain? I can't see it. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> um the solution is to integrate the two. Mm -hmm. And those books move towards doing that. Um, some take different theories forward, but that doesn't matter at this point. To simplify our way forward, I think we can assume the Bible focuses on growth from a hybrid cognitive perspective. I think that's fair. We could find examples where it's bodily, find examples where it's purely cognitive, how God appears to us, how we relate to him, and so on. Um, so the thinking part of us is highly important, but not supremely I think, and Tyler's shaking his head. Biblical data agrees. We're 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 on the right track. Um, I think it's to be tapered with non-cognitive theories and data to James and Lang. Um, so, in summary, God calls people via conversations and perceptions of the mind, but those perceptions are at least sometimes accompanied by physical sight and so on, visions and whatnot from biblical data. Further, I think the Bible uses parables and illustrations mm. specifically to shape our habits and to infect our imagination. Yes. And the imagination, if you see Aquinas and many other people, is not in the mind. It actually comes from the, the lower appetite, as they say in philosophy, <laughs> which is basically a fancy way of saying it comes from your body, <laughs> not directly from your mind. Yeah, yeah. And then it informs it later. Uh, so a hybrid cognitive theory, I think, allows for rational and critical thinking and theology and practice. But the critical point is to connect the brain and the body in this. And so emotions are used in decision making is what that means. And, and I personally have done research that triangulates at least 10 positive factors of how emotion plays into decision making. And a lot of them we can't help. We just do them naturally. So that's how God created us. It has to be, in my opinion. Um, but also if we if we took those away... Who our cognitive thinking would be severely hindered. Mm -hmm. um, so well, it just shows, I mean, practically it shows how, you know, um, how do I say this? People who both have high IQ and EQ are more successful. Emotional intelligence. Yeah, emotional, well. emotional, emotionally intelligent as well as intelligently intelligent. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they, yeah, they, they just are a lot more, Mm. successful is not the right word, but they're nicer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And, and, and to give a base example, if you have four options, your, your brain, uh, your, your emotions actually a factor into decision-making and pare down those to 
maybe there's two better options mm -hmm. for your survival and so on. And then you choose from one of the two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your decision making in your body is, is involved in helping to make decisions more simple and actually gravitating toward that which is better for you. And so in that sense, we actually can trust emotions. People say, you can't trust emotions at all. Well, it's, if we use emotions in decision making, which we do, that's the point of this exercise to, to show that, then how do we relate that to discipleship? And so that's where we get this idea of emotional discipleship. So we'll wrap up the episode and get uh, as practical as we can here. Yeah. I haven't defined an emotion. I'm hesitant to for a lot of reasons, but at the very least, emotions sometimes if you read Matthew the pine, I'll just summarize him quickly. There's two ways. Sometimes from the bottom up, from the body up to the mind and the mind factors in. And sometimes it's just the mind involved in the, in the body's not involved at all. So there's at least two ways that emotions come into the mind. Um, but ultimately emotions are probably evaluative construals, thought processes of the mind of bodily processes. So it's a very complex thing. Mm -hmm. If I was pushed against a wall, maybe that's what I would say. But the point is not, do we remember all these theories? Good. But knowing that, what does it mean for discipleship? Yeah. So take us there. Well, I think a fun place to start would be just to think about how, uh, how Jesus called people to discipleship and it was by calling them to follow, to follow him. And that, um, that includes, you know, basically adhering to his teaching. So there's a cognitive side, mm -hmm. but it also involved literally bodily following him around, um, and, and experiencing, um, alongside, you know, uh, alongside a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so, um, perhaps that's a, that's a way forward just to remember that basic discipleship metaphor of following Jesus. It will involve some teaching, absolutely, and some things that our disciples need to know. But it also involves our bodies, our experiences, our emotions, um, as we kind of uh, as as we experience them alongside our teacher, and he can kind of guide us in the right direction of how to use them and how to how to evaluate them and and uh, how to incorporate them into our growth. That's what I've, I I think that's a fun. Place let me to start. let me give you a quick a quick. Um, you're, you're preaching or you're teaching. Yeah. How do you use that in your preaching or your teaching to get people that you're that are in front of you and listening to see that it's not mind over body and so forth? Yeah. Oh, I love doing this. So uh, one of the things that I very practically I do on a very regular basis is when I preach or teach, when I read scripture, I read it with emotion, and everybody's like, oh, "Whoa." And it's like, it's all there. You just need to draw it out. Like this is, these are not boring stories. They're, they're stories that are meant to hit you and surprise you and disturb you and confront you and encourage you. And, and those are all, uh, emotional responses that, that we should have when we come to scripture. Um, and so that's a great way of integrating, mm -hmm. you know, there's mm -hmm. some reading, some things that you need to know, but also let's combine it with this emotional experience. And I think, and people tell me that it's very formative for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just in the realm of, of preaching or teaching, a very practical, like basically practical thing is how are you applying, you, you know, usually there's there's two or three things that you're helping students to apply or people to apply. Are all of those things cognitive? Perhaps it's it's worth considering whether some whether all of them should be. Maybe it's pr appropriate. Maybe that's the focus. It's fine, um, but maybe you might consider development of some kind of habit or some kind of practice that will involve the emotions uh, in something that's not just maybe one of those three things isn't purely cognitive. Yeah. Another thing that I encourage when I'm uh, preachers and when I do training with like uh, preachers who are still learning is I help them develop um, basically le learning outcomes or, or teaching aims in the realm of mm -hmm. things they should know, things they, sh things they should feel, and things they should do uh, as a basis or, or because of this teaching. Because like you said, if, if teaching is only about or preaching is only about the things that you know, then you're missing out on um, on the on the emotional experience, uh, on the, the bodily experience of what's happening, being confronted with your desires and your wants and your needs, 
as well as you said, developing habits. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are some things that I need to do now as a result of, of this, this moment, this experience, this confrontation with God's truth? Yeah, because essentially you can preach a, a truth and it goes to the mind. But if, if you if you give an application that's more towards building a habit, well, if if you if, if a student actually develops that habit of of say coming to Christ instead of some some something else, over the course of time that actually redirects their lower half, their the, not just their brain but their body. And if your dis, it, decision making is affected in part by your body emotions coming back up to your brain, then that's long term growth. Mm, that's right. That's integrated and long-term growth. Yeah, and in in the, the in the sense it can be trusted if it's oriented around the good. I don't have time to go into that, um, but shaping the habits and stuff can help us to get there. Uh, and, and again, if it's it, that's in me, in, in my opinion, that's a, a stronger view of discipleship than just a thought and and magically thinking, ah, I said the right thing, they understood it, so they're going to somehow put it into practice. Mm. Um, yeah, I also think just maybe one more th- thing here as we're closing. And this was brought up to actually by a student in, in, form, in a formation classroom in apologetics. <laughs> I came up with this then. Like, oh, this, that, that, this, this is an interesting thought. So I think how we view discipleship matters, hence we should bring emotion into it, emotional discipleship, as if we should add another word to discipleship. That's very common. Everybody <laughs> loves to do that. Not our intention there, but just simply saying emotion is important. Um, and I, I think we can actually broaden discipleship to include emotion. That's a good thing. Um for, for all the reasons we've said in this episode and more. And if we do so, it allows us then to include discussions eventually of mental health, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. things like anxiousness yeah. and so forth in a way that we just don't have access to if we don't have a model of discipleship where we're talking about these things. So if we and, broaden it, we yeah. can. And very practically, anxiousness, th- then if we can incorporate emotions into discipleship, anxiousness becomes not just a a problem for discipleship, but also an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just a, an emotion that, oh, like this generation is anxious, bummer. It's going to be harder to disciple them. Like, no, okay, what do we do with that? Like, that's a, that's a, it's actually a really helpful starting point. Yeah. I mean, what are, what are they anxious about? Mm-hmm. Address the negative, but what are they anxious for? Mm-hmm. That's a positive thing. We can work with that. Nice. I like that idea. Nice. Um, and, and beyond, if we don't disciple in a view or, or a way that prepares people for, the bad, yes, like that, that the bad stuff. Then, when a crisis comes, people leave faith, and everybody's surprised about it. In their mind, they saw faith as having a shallow foundation, and they abandoned it. And they abandoned it because of not having a category for emotions in those events, or simply because they only have emotional guidance but no truth to lead it. That's the cognitive or non-cognitive spectrum. Right, 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 right. Uh, so the problem, I think, is fixed. The answer that I said from earlier that we'll come back to and just highlight and move on and finish is by including mental health and other discussions in discipleship. So we can talk about anxiousness, and that's the higher level. I, I think at the lower level, if we're in tune with how the Bible and discipleship is impacting people, emotions, and so on, then we are truly meeting people where they're at and can lead them even more so to Christ, not just via their, their thinking rightly, but their body moving and following that direction as well. Any final thoughts? It's great. Take us home. Let's wrap it up. And that, that will do it for another episode. Um, who knows? Maybe we'll continue this conversation. Uh, I'm sure we will in some capacity in the next several episodes. We've barely touched the surface, but have tried to simply stir up conversations in the local places where you are listening and serving to see emotion as vital for proper decision making and therefore necessary to incorporate into discipleship. After all, we teach and lead to the heart, the seat of emotion, according to Robert Saucy in uh, a book called Minding the Heart, The Way of Transformation. So we teach and lead to the heart and not just to the head. We are being formed holistically by God and we are to disciple others holistically, which especially in today's times with the young generations needs to increasingly include properly handling and guiding emotions and, and uh, being uh, maybe moving away from anxiousness and fear um, to Jesus. And one final note is that we have something that we at Four Mission call sometimes open days, but sometimes experience days. And we have one of those coming up. So Tyler, do you want to tell us the date of that? Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to be equipped to navigate these uncharted waters of discipling a generation that is anxious and, and, uh, 
integrating mind and body in the European context in terms of your mission, you might consider joining us for an experience day, open day of Four Mission College. Um, we'll be meeting online from all over Europe on April 18th from 8.30 to 10.30 um, Central, uh, Central European time. And this is just a great uh, time to meet us, meet students, and understand what what uh, what it could look like for you to study theology, mission, and ministry in uh, a way that impacts your local European ministry. So we'd love to have you. You can write us at praxology at formission.org.uk, or you can also get in contact with us through our social media accounts, which is Formission EU, Facebook and Instagram. So we'd love to have you join us. Absolutely, we would. And that'll do it for this episode. We'll see you next time and go in peace. See you next time.